This is your PowerPoint on the 20th century and how it relates to the American identity. So the 20th century really begins in the late 1800s, and there's a reason for this. In the late 1800s, we're going to see the rise of a very competitive economic market that's based on industrialization. Now, this actually began with the Civil War. Uh, right after the Civil War and during it, Abraham Lincoln had invested in railroads during the Civil War, and this allowed for the federal government to become much more involved in the overall national economy in a way it really hadn't become before. Uh, not only did it provide grants for railroads, it also provided incentives for immigrants to move out west with something called homestead grants. Homestead grants basically allowed for immigrants to move out into the west, and if they resided on the land for a period of about 10 years, they could pay literally about $10 for the land. Uh, this did attract many people out into the West, and you might be thinking, well, then this was establishing sort of a, a farming base to America. Actually, no, it wasn't. By having railroads move out to the West, and now people move out to the West, the hope was that over the long term, this would start to form cities, and there would be populations of people in these areas to then inhabit these cities. Federal government also provided at this time incentives for technical colleges to be built, and these were done under the Morrill Land Grant. So notice what Abraham Lincoln was doing here. He was establishing a national market economy based upon long-term investment in technology. And this led to some major leaders of the new capitalist marketplace. And there's actually a, a controversy about this, about whether these leaders should be called the giants of capitalism or they should be called robber barons. So the leaders of capitalism, what they did at this time was that they noticed that capitalism was very disorganized. And so they attempted to monopolize markets under their control to provide what they believed was managerial control. And there were three basic ways that they tended to do this. Um, the first one was through vertical integration. Andrew Carnegie Carnegie bought up materials and the process to create steel. Um, horizontal integration was done by John Rockefeller, and he would buy up his oil competitors. Last up was J.P. Morgan, probably the most powerful out of all of these, and he did something called interlocking directorate. So this is kind of complicated, but the idea was this. J.P. Morgan would go out to a local bank, and he would tell them that you know they were about to fail, and so he would offer them a loan. In, re in return for that loan, they would have to allow for J.P. Morgan's guys to reside on their board of managers. By doing this, J.P. Morgan could basically interlock all these banks under his control. There were some problems that came up in the late 1800s for capitalism that would eventually have to be resolved. Um, first of all, workers began protesting and they were forming unions for minimum wages and maximum working hours. At the time, most people were working about 19 hours per day and they were making about $6 per week. Uh, because of that, workers advocated that there would be a 12-hour workday and then eventually it got down to an 8-hour workday and they began advocating for a basic minimum wage. Uh, farmers also complained at this time that railroads were charging unfair freight rates. So they started noticing that uh, long freight rates um, ended up having uh, much, much lower costs than short hauls. Uh, short hauls were actually charging more, which seemed kind of strange to farmers at the time. Uh, farmers also complained that there was a problem of a lack of currency in the economy. They noticed that people were not buying as much of their farming goods. And so they started advocating for something called bimetallism, where you would have both gold and silver in the economy in order to try to pump up the amount of consumer spending on farming goods. Uh, middle class businesses complained about people like John Rockefeller for using unfair competitive practices. John Rockefeller, for example, would hire people to go out and pose as employees for other businesses in order to spy on those businesses or even to do espionage where they would actually go out and they would destroy things from John Rockefeller's competitors to make it easier for him to buy them out. This led to a number of major reform movements in America at the time. Uh, one of the biggest ones was the Grange Movement, which tried to regulate railroads and pricing at a local level. They eventually failed due to Supreme Court decisions that said they could not do this. So that eventually led into the populace, who tried to establish what we talked about before, bimetallism, the use of gold and silver for currency. So the more gold, the more silver you put into the economy, the more consumer spending. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, doesn't that cause inflation? And you're right, it does. If you put more currency into the economy, you will cause inflation to occur. Populists would argue that this is not a bad thing. A certain level, obviously too much inflation would always be bad, uh, but populists would argue that a certain small degree of, of inflation would be good because not only would you have more consumer spending, but then on top of that, uh, owners of farms would be making more money and so they would be able to pay off their mortgages.
Eventually, this led into probably the most uh, broad-based movement that included all these movements, and that was the progressive movement, which argued that there was a need to break down monopolies through government regulation. Uh, unions for workers at this time formed, and they formed by creating collective bargaining groups, meaning that all the workers together would be uh, would be represented by somebody who would then man who would then bargain with owners to raise wages and better working conditions. So this led up to World War One. In World War One, European countries ended up competing for colonies in places like Africa, Asia, and the Baltics. This led to a series of alliances and a buildup of militaries between these different European countries. Now at the time, the U.S. wanted to stay out of the war, but eventually, due to Germany's use of U-boats or primitive submarine warfare, Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, decided to get involved. Now eventually, because Woodrow Wilson got the Americans involved, the war tipped in on the on the side of uh, the Allied powers, so that was Britain and France and the United States, and eventually they were able to win, and that kind of promoted Wilson to sort of a rock star status uh, within Europe and the United States, and Wilson promoted something called Wilsonian idealism, also known as the 14 points, and this is very important. So far we've been talking about the reform movements at home. What we're now seeing is the establishment of American international leadership throughout the 20th century. Wilsonian idealism stressed the idea that America had the military might, the open markets, and most importantly, the correct values, democracy and competitive economics, and that this should be spread throughout the world. The Roaring Twenties. After World War I, America experienced an economic boom in the 1920s. This was largely due to new technologies that had been created, like the refrigerator, the radio, the car, the airplane, and movies. Also, there was a huge movement of Americans out of the urban centers into suburbia. Most of this, though, had been financed on risky debt speculation on the stock market. And because of that, in 1928, there was a collapse of the stock markets. And once that collapse took place, there was a, a real strong questioning of capitalism. And this gets us into World War II. When the Great Depression took place, most people took a look at the United States and blamed the United States for what had happened. And so most people looking around the world said, you know, maybe there's something wrong with democracy. Maybe there's something wrong with capitalism. And they started looking to the alternatives, where there were two alternatives available at the time, Nazism and fascism, or communism. Now, back at home, the United States had a massive change in the way we did things between government and the people. Up until this time period, overall, the relationship of government to the people tended to be what we call laissez-faire. The government was supposed to stay out of the economy as much as possible and let local decisions be made. However, with the collapse of the economy during the Great Depression, Franklin Roosevelt, the president at the time, argued for a new role of government. He wanted what he called a New Deal, where the government would provide investments and direct cash to workers. Now, what was the idea behind this New Deal? Well, there's actually a lot of philosophy behind it that we'll get into when we talk talk about economics in the United States in the second unit, but for now, the idea behind it that I want you to see is that the government's role has changed. It's no longer laissez-faire, staying out of the economy. Rather, the government would act as an investor. They would come in and they would provide investments for local businesses to take off and direct cash to workers to boost consumer spending. This expanded the government's role, and it would also divide the American public between two different groups, those who advocated for a limited government and those advocated for an expanded interventionist government. So at the end of this, we run into World War II, and the Great Depression, like I said before, questioned democracy and capitalism. Most people in Europe saw two alternatives, fascism and communism, and most Europeans did not choose communism. They decided to choose fascism because at the time they saw fascism as sort of the traditional belief system because fascism had a lot of connotations to it of protecting religion, protecting tradition, protecting hierarchy. This led to Hitler's rise and expansion. Eventually, America was able to defeat Germany and Japan, and when they did so, they dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and this would rise America and its leadership in the world. So this connects us back again, back to Wilsonian idealism. With the development of technological inventions, especially the atomic bombs, America now becomes a leader in the world, and we become a leader in what's known as a bipolar world. It was the United States on one hand and the Soviet Union on the other hand. And this gets us into the Cold War.
The U.S. was the leader of the world after World War II, but it did have a competitor, the Soviet Union, which posed a very strong possible threat for the expansion of communism. The U.S. and the Soviet Union could not fight directly against each other uh, because they feared that this would lead into a nuclear war, so they fought something called a Cold War. And the idea of a Cold War is that you fight through your proxies or through your allies. So, for example, the Soviet Union might fight through a place like North Korea. Uh, the United States might fight through a place like South Vietnam. And this is what happened from 1945 to 1991. We didn't fight with Russia directly for fear of a nuclear war. We fought through our proxies or our allies, especially in the developing world. Now, during this entire time, there's something much more important going on, and I think it's, it's something that most Americans don't know about and don't understand. They tend to think that the Cold War was primarily a military struggle, and in some senses that's true. We did end up getting in a number of proxy fights in places like North Korea and places like Vietnam. We almost got into a major war in Cuba. There are a number of other areas where we were involved. But to be quite honest, most of the time we didn't fight that many wars throughout the Cold War, and it's probably because of our uh, monopoly and, and eventually sharing of the fight over nuclear bombs. Where we did have the most influence, though, was on economic leadership. And this was because we tried to defeat the communists through a new economic system called the Bretton Woods system. The United States at Bretton Woods uh, in New Hampshire created the following system. They created two major international institutions that are very important for this course from here on out. One is the International Monetary Fund and the other is the World Bank. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF, provides rules for international capitalism. Basically what the IMF does is it tells countries that they can get loans if they industrialize, they move people out of agricultural areas into urban areas, and if they fight inflation. If countries do this, then the World Bank will provide them with loans for development. Also, the Bretton Woods system tied global currency to the U.S. dollar. Now, this is very important. Up until this time period, uh, the way the global currency generally tended to work was that currencies were tied to gold. Uh, that was no longer the case. Now, global currencies were tied to the U.S. dollar, and the U.S. dollar was then tied to gold. Um, so what this attempted to do was to make the U.S. system into sort of the foundation, or what they call pegging the system to this foundation, to create stability around the world, to measure the way currencies were working, so it would provide for uh, clear markets. Now, the purpose of doing this was to integrate as many people into the U.S. capitalist system. So this led into this golden age of U.S. capitalism. From 1950 to 1970, the U.S. was the predominant economic leader. Internally, the U.S. experienced a massive economic boom. In fact, this was the largest time period when we saw a massive amount of people moving from urban centers into suburban centers. Throughout this entire time period, the U.S. showed very strong GDP growth. Okay, that's gross, gross domestic product growth. Um, there was also a strong development of the national economy, as was seen in the 1950s with the development of the Interstate Highway Act. Uh, that was when President Truman first, but then President Eisenhower, uh, created bills that allowed for a massive public works project that basically created highways that extended all the way across the country. Now, originally, the Interstate Highway Act was actually created for military purposes. It was created just in case we got into a nuclear arm war with the Soviet Union and planes had to have somewhere to land. But it ended up becoming a way for us to transport people and goods and labor across the country. And every time you'd create a part of the highway and you'd have an off-ramp, you'd create a little suburban center. And with suburban centers, you'd have malls that would pop up. And so this really created a very strong economic growth within America. However, there was an internal questioning going on at the same time. During this time, two major issues rose to question American leadership. In the 1950s, the Civil Rights Movement, led primarily by Martin Luther King Jr., but eventually by Malcolm X as well, questioned American racial justice. And in the 1960s, the Women's Rights Movement, led by Betty Friedan, she wrote The Feminine Mystique, in which she argued that women were suffering because they had been limited to this, this sort of like cult of feminine mystique, in which they had to operate in the domestic sphere and supposedly would gain their happiness in the domestic sphere. These movements that are like them would eventually lead to the questioning of, the, of, of rights for a whole range of groups. By the time that the 1960s and 1970s were done, people were questioning the treatment of Latinos, they were questioning the treatment of Asian Americans, they were questioning the treatment of gay Americans, they were questioning the treatment of a number of minority groups who didn't seem to be included in the overall, um, in the overall identification of what it meant to be American.
And then one of the strongest questionings of America at the international level happened with the Vietnam War. In 1964, the United States got heavily involved in the Vietnam conflict under something called the Gulf of Tonkin. Supposedly two U.S. battleships, um, the uh, C. Turner Joy and the Maddox, were both attacked supposedly by the North Vietnamese. Uh, because of this, the president at the time, President Lyndon Johnson, argued for the need for an American presence to be escalated, and it was escalated up to 500,000 troops. Now, in 1964, this was widely supported amongst most Americans. There was a minority of Americans that challenged this, but they were a minority. But by 1969, Americans had questioned this. And the reason why was two major events that took place. One was the loss at the Tet Offensive. Uh, the Americans had been told over and over again that the North Vietnamese could not wage a major battle against the United States. And then in 1969, a massive attack was done by the North Vietnamese against the South Vietnamese and the Americans in what was called the Tet Offensive. Now, the truth is, by the end of the Tet Offensive, the Americans actually won. Uh, they defeated the North Vietnamese and pushed them back into the area. But this was such a shock to Americans who had been told that there was no way the North Vietnamese could do this, that there was a, a something called the credibility gap. Basically, there was a loss of faith in the government at this point. Also, Americans found out through the Pentagon Papers that the government actually lied about the Gulf of Tonkin in the first place. Supposedly, it came out that the Sea Turner Joy and the Maddox had not exactly been attacked the way that Lyndon Johnson claimed. One of the battleships had been attacked, but the attack was so lacking in severity uh, that it was discovered when one of the captains of the ship came out and just simply found some bullets on the uh, deck of the ship. The second major attack that took place, second major supposed attack that took place, was really a weather storm that happened out in the North Vietnamese waters. It was not an attack at all. The radars read it as an attack. They then told Lyndon Johnson that it had not been attacked yet he still went ahead with escalating troops. This caused a huge credibility gap between the American government and the American people. By the 1970s, the U.S. economy was also largely questioned from within. This happened largely in 1973 when something called stagflation happened. This was a new economic problem that the U.S. had never seen before. Both unemployment and inflation were rising at the same time. Now, why was this happening? Well, there are a number of theories about why it happened, but it was probably a combination of two events. One, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, had raised prices on oil throughout the world by limiting its supply. Um, OPEC is largely a group of Middle Eastern countries. Venezuela is also a part of OPEC. OPEC cut back on supply and that raised prices. Um, another possible reason why we see a, a rise of inflation and unemployment at the same time was a rising expectation about wages back at home. Each year as prices went up, U.S. American workers demanded that their wages go up a same, similar percentage. This caused inflation to go up, and at the same time, it caused unemployment to go up since businesses were losing out on be people being able to afford to buy things. The traditional ways of controlling these kinds of problems just didn't work anymore, and this is because in the past, uh, the tools that were used by government to solve problems usually were able to solve either unemployment or inflation, not both at the same time. So there was a questioning at the time of the primary form of economics that was used called the Keynesian economics that had been instituted back during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's time period. So in the 1980s, there was a revolution against what had happened previously for the last 50 years. In the 1980s, under a president named Ronald Reagan, uh, there was what was called the Reagan Revolution. Uh, Ronald Reagan promoted something called supply-side economics. This type of economics promoted the idea of reducing taxes and reducing regulations in order to create more money for investment. The argument was that this would lead to more jobs and more tax revenue. Now, how would this take place if you're cutting taxes? Well, the more jobs that there is, the more economic growth there would be. And because of that, then even if you kept tax rates low, supposedly, you would see more, more uh, tax collection. From 1983 to 1987, there was a dramatic economic growth. But during this time period, there was also a growing question of economic inequality. Most of the economic growth that took place ended up being shifted up to the upper class. And so there was a question of whether or not inequality was taking place. And if it was, would there be any damage in the future? In the 1990s, Bill Clinton became president. When he did, he criticized the Reagan era for soaring debts and economic inequality. He attempted to find what was called a third way of politics. It incorporated some of Reagan's ideas, but brought back some of the old ideas from the 1950s and 1960s. The idea was the government would get involved, but it would also try to keep taxes low and regulations low. 
Also, there were a number of international treaties that Bill Clinton signed in order to increase trade by lowering what's called tariffs, or taxes on imported goods. For example, America signed a trade agreement called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, in which America, Mexico, and Canada would lower their tariffs to increase regional trade. Also, the United States joined a new international organization called the WTO, the World Trade Organization. This international court is, was established in order to provide a place for litigating tariffs, meaning that if a country raised its tariffs, it could be punished by the WTO by being kicked out of the organization. Now, you might wonder, well, what does it matter if you're kicked out of the WTO? Well, if you're kicked out of the WTO, you can no longer trade with the other member nations. And most of the member nations are big member countries like China and Russia and the United States. So if you get kicked out of the WTO, it's going to hurt your trade in the long term. The Bill Clinton administration was trying to increase free trade across the world so that at home, it could have the government intervene in specific areas like, for example, minimum wage increases or training workers or providing for more college education. After the Clinton administration, George Bush ran on a restoration of dignity to the U.S. presidency due to Clinton's scandals. Yet what eventually came to really identify the George Bush administration was the post-9-11 world. So in, on September 11th, uh, Al-Qaeda, a new terrorist organization, attacked the World Trade Center and really turned the world's focus towards Al-Qaeda and international terrorism. President Bush then made the argument that there was a need to intervene in the country of Iraq to stop weapons of mass destruction from being able to be passed off to Al-Qaeda. American forces eventually became stuck in Iraq in the midst of a civil war between the major Islamic sects there, especially Shiism and Sunni. And then in 2008, there was a massive global economic collapse based upon a new type of international trade called derivatives. A derivative basically just means added value. And the idea was this, banks would sell loans for housing to the stock market. These were then insured to make sure that uh, the banks could not lose. And by doing that, this allowed banks to speculate in very risky markets. By 2008, it turned out that a lot of the loans given out to homeowners were actually very poor loans to people who could not pay these loans back. And so there was a global freeze in which banks would not lend to one another because they feared that all of these loans that were building up on their books were actually what was called toxic loans. And that led to President Barack Obama. Obama came into office facing both the economic collapse that had taken place as well as a continued instability within the Middle East. And this really questioned overall American economic and political leadership. So it appears that what Obama has done is that he has attempted to resurrect the old economic Keynesianism of the 1950s and 1960s in which the government would get pretty involved within the economy. And so today we seem to be in a fight in America economically between Reaganism and Obamanomics. Reaganism being the idea of cutting taxes and cutting regulations, and Obamanomics, the idea that the government should get involved in certain parts of the economy in order to try to build consumer spending and to make sure uh, that the economy grows from the middle class uh, buying more and more consumer goods. So 20th century, obviously, as you can see, is a highly complex time period. And what can we kind of take away from it in order to summarize this very complex time period? What we seem to be in a fight about, as I said in the last slide, is that there's a challenge to American economic identity. Either we are going in the direction of having more laissez-faire, government sticking out of economic issues, or more, more government intervention. At our social identity issue, we are still fighting over the old civil rights issues. Um, and our big fight has been a fight between whether or not we are a country of integration or if we are a country of fragmented different groups and multiculturalism. Internationally, we are still a leader, but we are being challenged by major ethnic national movements and by huge nation states like China, Al-Qaeda, and Al-Qaeda's offshoots. So the 20th century really sees American identity as being challenged on numerous levels, domestically and internationally. And that's where we really have to try to answer the question in class, what is left of the American identity?